This video is brought to you by me. For $1 a month, you can support the channel directly and help me keep doing what I love. Thanks for watching and supporting. It dawned on me that I've been playing Tony Hawk games for more than 20 years. It shouldn't have surprised me, but it did, probably because it means I'm getting older. But playing a series for as long as this means I've played almost every title this series has to offer. From playing the original three Pro Skater games on N64 with my grandma, way back at the series start, through the fall with Proving Ground and the unfortunate spin-off Downhill Jam, and then all the way back through the rebirth through fire like a phoenix with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 Plus 2. Everyone who has played this series usually has their favorite era marked by what they cared about the most. Some people love the classic Hawk with the two minute sessions and collecting skate. Others love the pseudo open world of American Wasteland with the quest to rebuild Green Pipes Point. But one game in particular cut the series into two halves, a before and after Christ air if you will. Tony Hawk's Underground changed the series forever by building in a fully-fledged story, linking the freeride challenges from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 into a unified narrative. In this video, I wanted to take a look at how Underground and Underground 2 have aged in terms of level design in relation to the series, as well as the mechanics introduced in these games. Of course, we'll mention the humor as well, because it isn't exactly a secret how poorly it's aged. But I don't want to outright dunk on these games, it's too easy and they were a product of their time. Instead, I want to see what has held up and celebrate that instead. Tony Hawk's Underground shifted the series into a totally new direction and took control of the pros away and instead put you and your created skater in the starring role. You play as an independent kid who grew up in a rough area of New Jersey trying to turn his love of skating into a viable career path. There's only one problem. Your friend, Eric Sparrow. Eric is a wedgie you can't pick out, the splinter in your thumb you can't quite remove, the paper cut you get when you put your rent check in an envelope. He kicks the chair out from under you so he can take it for himself. Eric Sparrow is the ultimate villain. He takes your character's trust and drags it through the mud. When Chad Muska comes to town and gives your skater advice to get sponsored by the local skate shop, Sparrow sets a drug dealer's car on fire and forces you to flee with him to New York City. When you get your big shot at a big break in the Tampa competition, Eric conveniently forgot to send in your registration form, forcing you to go on a wild goose chase to impress the pros and convince them to let you in. And the pudding icing on the crap cake, Eric's biggest betrayal of all, is accepting the favor to film you doing a McTwist over a helicopter and then quote unquote, had it taken away at customs so he can bury you in your team's skate video and take the new pro status for himself. What a manipulative little flea. The rivalry between you and Eric is the main conflict of the story as you keep putting in the work and Sparrow keeps kneecapping you in your efforts to swoop in and steal the glory. Luckily, before the credits appear on the screen, you tear up Eric's favorite line in New Jersey and win the tape back. However, he keeps his millions of dollars and you're still relatively unknown, so it's hardly satisfying. However, there is a secret ending you get for playing the game twice. One that is much more satisfying. That was some sick footage. Too bad no one ever saw it. You backstabbing, mob flipping cockroach. Hey, hey, what do you say? One last trip around the neighborhood. Winner takes the tape. Underground takes you all over America and the world from your starting hometown of New Jersey all the way to Moscow, Russia. Some of these levels are great like Jersey and Hawaii and the awesome setup for the Slam City Jam. I really like the Manhattan stage that has infinite lines and possibilities for huge combos. But I'm not sure if these areas reach the iconic level of warehouse, hangar, or the school, but at the very least they are all good. None of them are outright boring or empty, and I think that's important for a game that lives and dies by the number of things you can trick off of. In Tony Hawk's Underground, you won't only be riding your skateboard, no. You'll be driving cars, and you'll even be driving your feet. Driving cars in Underground is nothing short of terrible. Every vehicle feels like paper on a wire frame, and on top of that, turning feels totally wrong. It's a bit hard to describe, but the cars don't feel like the wheels are what guide them. 
They turn on a pivot from the center of the car so it always looks and feels totally off. It's likely not surprising to anyone that the driving mechanics didn't return in any other game. But Underground also introduced walking which changed everything. Getting off your board really opens up navigation in meaningful ways and also means that there is a new opportunity for platforming and vertical navigation to mixed results. No one is playing this over Mario, but it still adds a lot. Getting off your board and climbing ledges makes getting places much easier in a lot of cases than it would be by traditionally using your board. It also adds complexity to combos as you can begin combos on your board, hop off, and run for a limited time without ending the combo before diving into a new pool or a rail to continue it. I don't want to linger on it, but of course there's a large amount of dumb humor that comes from this era of games that has aged really, really badly. Like when you get to Tampa and a cop almost kills you because a taillight on your car is out and forces you to run errands in exchange for Eric's freedom. Side note, we should have just left him there. He set enough vehicles on fire to have broken a number of laws. There are also tasteless Asian caricatures, a weird amount of sexual content like having to grind on a car that belongs to a guy cheating on his wife, and the woman in there really gets into it, for a lack of a better description. But there are also about a hundred different ways that your skater calls the cops picked without directly calling him that. What's your problem, Bacon Bits? Wake up on the wrong side of your mother this morning? Bacon Bits is very good. Now let's talk about the music in this game because what is a Tony Hawk game without a soundtrack? Overall, this soundtrack is a really good mix of hip hop, rock, and punk. You've got Jurassic 5, music from Alkaline Trio, Kiss, Sublime, and I could keep going on and on. It's so good. I personally like to play Tony Hawk games on sick difficulty because it mostly just makes you do more challenges before you can proceed, which mostly means you get to see more of what the game has to offer. But Underground's difficulty curve is a flat surface until the final few missions of the game when it becomes a 90 degree ascent into a wall. The final few challenges are so difficult. Like how this pro challenge throws more tricks at you than you can possibly handle. Or the challenge of comboing the whole city, which wouldn't be nearly as hard if it didn't have a rail perpendicular to the rail you jump off of, which kills all your momentum. In fact, I so deeply associate this game with the difficulty spike at the very end, I've only ever beaten the game one time before this. But in spite of that, this game pushed the series in a whole new direction, and as such, it's a lot of people's favorite entry. The story gives you another reason to care about your skater and a classic rags to riches story all while introducing gaming's evilest Bye. villain. It reinvigorated the series for a new generation of gamers and for that it's an important game in the series. I rarely ever get the itch to play it personally, but that's likely due to the fact that I was too busy playing the game that came next. Tony Hawk's Underground 2 was one of my first T-rated games that I was able to get for myself as a kid. It felt like a new height of maturity for me, which is hilarious because it is one of the dumbest fucking games I've ever played. Thug 2 is where Tony Hawk meets Jackass. It's hardly a sequel to Underground at all, but probably was just an attempt to capitalize on the Underground name. You can recreate your skater from the first game, or you can create a new one. It doesn't matter. Since the story is mostly standalone outside of you getting abducted in New Jersey, you can jump right in here. If you didn't play Underground twice and get the secret ending, you didn't get a satisfying ending to the Sparrow beef, and you won't find one here either. Sparrow amounts to little more than the butt of every joke. He pees his pants, eats sh** in a hot dog cart, and has to have his head surgically removed from a butt. Comedy. Instead of the continued journey of your skater, you get kidnapped mid-combo and are brought to the warehouse where Tony Hawk and Bam Margera lay out their plans for a worldwide tour of destruction and chaos. But let's talk about how the structure of the tour works. Bam and Tony draft two different teams of skaters who complete challenges for points. The team at the end of the tour with fewer points has to pay for the whole thing. You start each location as yourself with a list of goals to complete, and you unlock more goals by finding pros, secret skaters, and special guests in the stage. Mostly, you get to choose which pro you find in the city, which means you get to choose Rodney Mullen and only Rodney Mullen because duh. The secret skaters are the skaters who are from the location you're visiting. Boston has Ben Franklin again, Barcelona has a Matador, Skatopia has baby Ryan Sheckler, etc. The special guests are a whole different beast because they aren't skaters at all. Replacing the driving mechanics from underground, the special guests are always riding a motorized abomination. 
you can find Steve-O riding a mechanical bull on wheels, Jesse James is riding a custom Segway. These guests usually result in challenges that require more gimmicky goals because the physics of these machines operate totally different than the skateboards. The World Destruction Tour is all about big stunts and generally annoying the locals and being casually yet aggressively racist everywhere they go, destroying pieces of history and culture in their wake, all while exploiting every stereotype in the book. Quick, what's the first thing you think of when you think of Spain? Bulls and Matadors? Got it. Can I be frank for a second? As a person from New Orleans, I am so sick and tired of New Orleans being portrayed as the alcoholic capital of the world when the real people who perpetuate the stereotype are the tourists who come in and piss all over the streets because they can't walk straight enough to find a restroom. Neversoft really nailed our weekly tradition of raising the dead in our cultist rituals, though. Listen, I could write a dissertation on how offensive this game can be, and as much fun as it is to poke at the sheer amount of offensive garbage, I'm gonna be honest. On a gameplay level, I freaking love this game. It's a fossil from a different time, just like my racist grandma, sure, but the concept of the world tour means all bets are off when it comes to challenges. There is so much variety in what you're doing. One minute you have 60 seconds to break a high score like the classic games, and another minute you're doing a 720 degree grapple being launched 10 stories into the sky by a catapult. The sheer creativity in the ways you can destroy things also makes the journey to a new place all the more interesting because you can look out for ridiculous opportunities to activate a new chaotic cutscene. Like you can light your board on fire and set off cannons that wrecks a construction site in Boston. It's dumb fun, but it's fun nonetheless. Now let's wrap up this game with a look at the soundtrack. I remember very distinctly this one in particular opening me up to a ton of new music across the spectrum. Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire, Frank Sinatra, Atmosphere, Violent Femmes, X, The Doors. This is probably one of the best soundtracks in the series for the variety alone. If you can look past the parts of this game that have aged like raw milk, and I wouldn't blame you if you couldn't, but if you can, you'll find a structurally sound couple of games that provide a lot of fun things to do within these sandboxes. At both of their cores is the Tony Hawk skateboarding engine you've known and loved all along with just more built on top of it and a lot more variety of things to do. Some of it is good and some of it is bad, but when it's working, it's really working. These games are from a very specific time in pop culture, and they reflect their era of MTV pranks and reality TV. I can get rid of the humor, but these two games represent a very specific part of the Tony Hawk anthology. So while maybe I don't feel more grown up for owning them anymore, in fact I feel the opposite, these games still come from a time when the Tony Hawk games were good and doing new things with every entry, and for that I look back on them very fondly. But now I turn the discussion over to you. What is your favorite era of Tony Hawk and why? What are your favorite soundtracks? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, please consider hitting the like button. If you are new to the channel and want to see more, subscribe and hit that bell to make sure you never miss an upload. Lastly, if you'd like to support the channel directly, check out my Patreon in the description. You can get exclusive videos for as little as $1 a month. I'd like to take a moment and thank my higher tier patrons, Andrew Lang, Andrew Elmore, Just Jessica, and 8BitJesus. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.